All right, uh, hello everybody. My name is Luke Meller. I'm the marketing director for Pantonium. Uh, we're a Toronto-based software company working with public transit agencies to bring on-demand transit uh, to their riders. And today I'm excited to share a story about exactly that. Um, and today's webinar is titled, How Fort Erie Transit Covered Rural and Urban Areas with On-Demand Transit. And just before I introduce our guests, I'll handle some housekeeping. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and uh, you will be provided a recording automatically after the webinar is complete. So don't worry if you have to step out. And if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, and if you see any questions in that Q&A box that you want answered, you can vote for them. Um, and we'll try to save some time by the end uh, to address anybody's questions or comments. Um, and now what's really exciting today is uh, our three guests uh, who are so gracious uh, with their time. Uh, we are joined by Wally Beck, who is the president of Beck Consulting. And Wally has over 40 years of experience, both running public transit and uh, spending, a decade as, uh, spending a decade as a senior transit official uh, for Kitchener-Waterloo in Ontario. And then he has also spent decades as a transit consultant. Um, and in that capacity, he was involved in the creation of this new Fort Erie Transit service. Uh, we we're also joined uh, by Jennifer Pennell Ajay. Ajay? <laughs> got <it>. Ajay. <laughs> Ajay? Okay, got it. Um, she's the, the transit coordinator for the town of Fort Erie, and she spent more than three and a half years administering uh, Fort Erie Transit. And it was her expertise with government procurement. Uh, uh, that led to the development of the RFP that resulted in this project. And we're also joined by Ashley Greaves, who is the operations manager for Regional Limousine, uh, who is the operator for Transit On Demand. Uh, so uh, she's been on the front line since uh, before the, uh, the service started, uh, managing its day-to-day -day operations and its deployments and handling uh, the customers. Um, so we have a full spectrum of perspectives, so the consulting, the city itself, and the operations, and, and of course, the technology. Um, and just for some background, um, to make a long story short, in 2021, Fort Erie Transit decided to replace all of their fixed routes, um, all their fixed route transit, uh, with an on-demand transit service. Um, and then just after a few months uh, this winter, uh, that service had a dramatic impact on ridership. So um, just looking at the February, March numbers for 2022, ridership has increased uh, 50%. Um, and it's growing even uh, as we speak. So, so, it, so far, it's been a successful deployment. And I, I'm just going to jump right in. And uh, for the first question for Jennifer, um, can you describe some of the Fort Erie Transit operations and the service area uh, prior to the on-demand transit setups, so just give us some context for you know the, the size and scope of the operations and, and what you guys were doing uh, just before we started with the on-demand. Sure. So um, Fort Erie is a large landscape. Uh, we have 168 square kilometers of um, of land that uh, belongs to the town of Fort Erie, and uh, within that, um, we have several little pockets of community. So we don't actually have. Um, what would be considered an official downtown um, and an official kind of like one spot, you know, major spot in Fort Erie. We have several little communities that have come together to make Fort Erie and such that we have several little small urban areas um, that uh, are smaller urban areas that are actually expanding quite rapidly right now. But um, they were um, so we, we we were trying to connect all of those communities um, together, but we have this large span of space in between, a lot of rural areas in between these little pockets of communities. And um, the challenge was trying to find an effective service that could um, pick up people in these, these areas and still um, be timely for, for those folks. Um, we had been running um, what might have been considered a community bus prior to 2017. Uh, we had one bus that kind of ran around the what we consider Fort Erie proper um, is sort of the bigger, the biggest part of Fort Erie, the biggest urban area, and it would uh, trickle down into Ridgeway and Crystal Beach, a couple of our other little uh, pockets of community, and then loop back through. That ride took people quite a long time. Um, if you had to do from one end to the other, it could take you more than an hour. Um, as such, the town undertook a study 
to uh, a transit study to, to see, you know, what's the feasibility, what can we do to improve this service? And it was decided a fixed route service uh, would work. And um, we had at the beginning, we had three um, transit routes, uh, one that we called the East route, which meant uh, went through the main part of Fort Erie. We had the West route, which came out of the main part of Fort Erie into Crystal Beach Ridgeway. We had the North route that went up through Stevensville Black Creek. Um, each route was an hour loop and they actually started with a two-way loop. So one hour it would go clockwise and then the other hour would go counterclockwise, uh, which was a little confusing for some of our riders um, in that each hour, depending on the hour, they would have to be on one side of the street or the other to catch the bus. And uh, people found that a little confusing um, to, to say the least as to where they would stand and the timing and everything. So uh, after some consultation, they decided to just go back to a, a clockwise route on each of those services. So they would just be one hour, every hour just looping around. And they all met at the, uh, the hub that we have at um, near town hall. And that's where our regional bus from Niagara Falls also meets, um, would meet the transit on the hour uh, to take people out uh, outside of Fort Erie into Niagara Falls. Um, so that's sort of the background of where our transit was. And as we talked to folks, as we looked at routes, um, as this concept of, you know, demand responsive transit or on-demand transit came, came about and communities were using it more and the technology was being more advanced, we started looking into that uh, wondering whether that could help our system um, advance and pick up more people. So what we were finding was sometimes people's routes, in order for them to get to, let's say, from Crystal Beach across to what we call Jarvis Street, which is, you know, way across town over by the river, some people would be on the bus for an hour and a half um, or more just trying to get to work maybe or, you know, to the bank or whatever it was that they needed to go. And um, it was really tough for them. Uh, to do that. And uh, we just found that we weren't getting a lot of ridership. Um, our North route was exploding money. <laughs> um, it, it was, you know, for maybe the few handful of riders that we had on a regular basis for them, it was, it was a wonderful service that was, con you know, was helpful for them to, to be able to get around, but it just was not, uh, the cost per rider was exponential. And we wanted to find another solution. So we started looking at this first mile, last mile type of concept where on demand could bring people from rural areas into urbanized areas and beyond. However, when we started looking at if we could maybe hybrid the service, have a fixed route with a, an on demand, we figured the majority of people are coming in from the outlining areas going to our major business districts. And if we brought them in from the outlining areas to the hub and then told them to get on a bus to go elsewhere, it literally only takes a few more minutes you know, on a on-demand transit to just get to that Walmart stop or whatever down the road. And we, we figured some people would, there would be a, an imbalance of um, service. So some people would enjoy a better level of service than others perhaps in the town. So we decided to just model it and go full on demand. <laughs> and we felt that that was the fairest um, way to offer transit to all of the riders in, in, within the boundaries of Fort Erie. So we were able to now, uh, rather than, we have about 33,000 people um, living in town, plus an extra 10,000 summer visitors, summer residents, we call them, uh, pre-COVID anyway, uh, that used to come into Fort Erie. Uh, hopefully they will return this year. Um, so, and then we, but we were only hitting maybe 20,000 of that 33,000 population um, when it came to transit, access to transit. And, you know, we, we struggled with how do we operate and how do we offer transit to all of those riders. So On Demand offered us that solution. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for the, the context. And um, I just to follow up with that, I, I, we're probably all sick of this, uh, this conversation topic, but what experience, can you give, give us a little bit of background on what happened during COVID? Uh, we, can, we can breeze through this part pretty fast. I think we are all familiar uh, with the damage it's caused to transit, but uh, just to give a, it, it is it, contextually, I'm sure it was important for you guys. Uh, sure. Yeah, it definitely was. We, we were actually seeing, um, uh, we were actually seeing an, an uptick in our transit prior to COVID hitting us. Uh, and then as we all know, March, the end of March, we just crashed, right? We, we just lost 
more than 50% of our riders. Um, and for a small system, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, when you when you're in a big city and you have two million riders and you lose half, you're still getting a million on there. We, you know, when we have 40,000 a year and now we lose half of them, um, that that's a that's a big hit to the system. Um, it's a lot of diesel buses running around with uh, very empty seats. And um, so, you know, as uh, for us, it was it was a real big push to, let's say, get this concept off the ground. So we really started the hard work during that time to do more research and, and get through it and say, we can, um, we can offer this uh, service to our customers, um, be more uh, fiscally responsible, be more environmentally responsible and, um, and offer riders, uh, offer transit to those riders who really needed it. I mean, we were operating this whole time to ensure that essential workers got to where they needed to go um, but we did actually reduce our service hours just because we looked at, you know, when were people riding and where did they need to go? And so we actually shortened our service hours during COVID, um, because of, you know, just low ridership in general. And, um, now that when we, we, when we introduced the on-demand back, we went back to our original, uh, service hours and, um, it really took off for us. We, we, we saw the ridership starting to come back exponentially, right? Even in the beginning, um, people were excited about the service. And um, I, I would say, and this may be somewhere down the line in our questioning, but uh, I can maybe mention at this point, the only one, one of the major uh, drawbacks to having on-demand and we use minivans as our um, way of transporting uh, those around, um, we, we did find with COVID getting, um, people in a close proximity like that, rather than they were used to being on a large bus with maybe one or two people, they could really spread out yeah. on smaller vehicles, uh, meant people had to be closer together. So we really had to make sure that our COVID protocols were in place, that we had protections in place for the drivers and the passengers. We offer masks. We have, uh, dividers between the driver and, um, the back seats, we have, you know, lots of ways to pay for the transit. So there, we we tried to mitigate that risk um, in other ways, but unfortunately, people did have to sit a little closer. Now that restrictions are being eased, we're able to open um, some more seats inside the vehicles as well for people. Okay, and so so my next question is for Wally, um, just on this topic of the design process. Uh, so what what do in your view what did you think? what was driving this decision, which is a pretty radical decision for a transit agency to, to take, you know, to convert completely from fixed route to on demand. So can you walk me through, uh, walk us all through some of those processes and maybe touch on how you've seen on demand deployments in the past? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, uh, Luke. First of all, I, was, <clears throat> I wasn't sold on this. <laughs> uh, uh, just for the, for the audience, I assist, uh, uh, regional limousine uh, with this project, as well as uh, act as uh, indirectly as an advisor to the town of Fort Erie. And I did their, their conventional transit study that led to four routes. And the design of those routes was to increase the coverage and provide a minimum service. So it's basically a, you know, a community bus service because you've got service every hour and it's really not designed for commuters, that sort of thing, just, just to get people uh, shopping and uh, critical trips, you know, medical trips, and so on. So, when uh, when we looked at it, looked at it a little closer, realized that their demand is only a few passengers per hour uh, with conventional transit pre-COVID. So, worked with uh, uh, regional limousine in the town uh, on, you know, the town had four buses, a couple of spares. What they've done is throw instead of conventional transit buses or even minibuses four vans and two spares. And what I've seen is, uh, first of all, the demand for service increased well beyond what it was in the previous month with COVID. But it's now gotten to the point where it's exceeding the pre-COVID demand. And this is only after what, uh, seven months, I can't add here. So, so that, but, you know, wh why is that? And, uh, and I looked at it and what was happening is there's a peak service increase for the work trip. And uh, so what the regional limousine has taken their spare vehicles and thrown them out during the peak to accommodate the peak hour demand. Before, before that, they're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So they take three, instead of running three vehicles on a Saturday, they take those hours on a Saturday, 
put it in during the week somewhere. So now we're at a point where um, uh, there are performance criteria. By the way, I, I like performance uh, 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 contracts, performance-based contracts. It, uh, it benefits everybody. But we're at a point now to meet the requirements in terms of the performance criteria, the, the average wait time and travel time. Uh, I don't see anything other than having to add additional vehicles during the peak hour. So like all six vehicles are, are in service and everybody knows in the industry, you've got to have a spare ratio. Otherwise, uh, you've got to shut down service at the time. So that's, um, I think that's what, you know, the key points I want to bring to this. And the other fact, it is, is a, it is a regional, uh, more of a regional service that are part of the community. So I, this seems, seems to be a good fit. But just too successful, sir. Yeah. And, and Jennifer, I, I was wondering if you could add to that. Do you think, uh, you know, too successful? I mean, that's always nice to have. But um, maybe we can drill down into the, understand the details. And my thesis, and I think everybody uh, has the same kind of ideas, it was the expansion of the service area that has caused this ridership increase. So, you know, we're trying to find some reasons. Um, it could be, or as Wally suggested, it could be that because it's more convenient, you're getting more commuters. So kind of a different rider subset. So, so of those two possibilities, what do you think uh, is driving this ridership? Like where are these riders coming from? And uh, is it the increase in service area or is it the change in the, the deployment type or is there something else going on here? I actually think it's a combo. Um, so th the fact that we're serving all riders now in every square inch of Fort Erie is quite fantastic. Um, and those who didn't have access to transport before are now um, realizing that they can get places. Um, we don't have a, an explosion of our rural riders at this point. However, what we're seeing is um, those that are moving between our urbanized areas to another urbanized area, um, that's growing. And uh, we are seeing this shift of the use. Our, so our, as Wally alluded to, we, we used to be more of a, uh, let's go run our errands on the bus kind of service. Um, so we saw a peak in the middle of the day, people going you know, to Walmart or Toby's or wherever they were going um, and home. And now we're seeing um, this uh, commuter traffic, which we never experienced before. So we're seeing people getting rides much earlier in the morning and in that end of day period when you see um, work ending, uh, we're getting a lot more riders in that sense. And they're, we're able to bring them more conveniently to and from their destination. So they're able to get picked up at a bus stop in their urbanized area. And maybe they're going to their employer who's in a more rural area where we couldn't get to before and now they can so we have um some employers that are we're getting pick up and drop offs you know in the morning for five six seven people um we're getting usage out of community groups so community groups are having an easier time with their uh their community members and they're purchasing passes and you know getting them bus cards uh we're watching the high school um, we sit, our, our town hall sits right across from um, our, our large high school, and there's buses all the time running through that, um, our new vehicles now. Um, the, the students are finding it convenient. They're going to their co-ops uh, using our vehicles, uh, whereas the bus timing may not have worked out for them before, but now it works out. They can use it. Um, they get to their after-school jobs. Um, and where the bus wasn't that convenient for when school let out and they could, you know, get up the street. Now they're very conveniently being able to get to and from those destinations. Um, so you're welcome, parents. Um, we're, we're, <laughs> we're helping out those uh, parents of high school students who are always frantic about how they're going to get their kid to their after school job. Now they can just get there. It's safe. Um, it's, uh, it's convenient. And so we're seeing this explosion of our our riders came, our old riders came with us. Um, some of them had a little bit of a learning curve to book it and plan their day and understand how to use the technology. A lot of them were just used to walking out to a bus stop and standing there knowing the bus would come at that exact time and move on. Um, so there was some learning and education involved in um, uh, selling this system to the, the existing users. 
uh, I find our younger generations um, are picking this service up quite quickly um, and, and they love it. So the old adage, it's the, the Uber of Fort Erie. Uh, I think some people are calling it the Fort Erie Uber. Um, we'd like to get away from that a little bit, but um, as we are not a, a taxi, personal taxi or, or an Uber in that sense, um, we are using a stop to stop network in our, with our existing um, stops that we had on our fixed routes. And we do an address-based service of those people who are in rural areas that uh, have unsafe walking areas to, to get to a bus stop. So they don't, large ditches, no sidewalks, things like that. Um, we're, we're, we're doing it on an address-based service. N again, not a huge explosion in those rural areas, but enough to, um, the, the service is convenient enough for those who wanna um, move from one area to the other and not have to transfer and not have to spend an hour and a half to do it. Um, our average ride time, correct me if I'm wrong, Ashley or Wally is somewhere around the 20 minute mark now, 20, 25 minutes um, ride time, I think, uh, and about a 10 to so minute wait for the phone call. Yeah, so it's uh, an average, usually uh, the last time that we looked was about a 10 minute wait um, on average, and then the ride time was close to 15 minutes, so. So it beats an hour and a half. <laughs> Just wanted to add, uh, Jennifer, uh, the Fort Erie has urban, if you want to call them urban stops in the communities, but they had they have flag stop in between the communities. So, uh, so this being address uh, address based help. So it just fits in for those flag stop uh, uh, practices. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it worked out well. Uh, excellent. And so just to touch on a point that Jennifer made, and maybe we can uh, jump in whoever has an answer. Um, how was accessibility considered in this? Because every time you take a fixed route system where just anybody can stand by a stop and, or wait or stand on the road and wave at a bus and get, get transit, um, it's a lot different now where there is almost a gatekeeper between a rider and the transit service. So how was accessibility uh, considered in the service and how, how, are you, how did you make sure that nobody got left behind in the community? And maybe, uh, yeah, any, anybody can answer that one. <laughs> sure you all. can start or Wally, if you wanna start. Well, uh, half the van, I think half the vans are wheelchair accessible. Yeah. So uh, um, the scheduling and, and uh, what happens in the background ac accounts for the uh, boarding and a lighting time of that person in, in a wheelchair. So that helps uh, the real time scheduling of the service. And, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, those that normally take the fast transit or uh, area accessible transit, uh, some of them have converted over to, to this for at least some of their trips. Yeah, we really want to open it up and make sure that um, we didn't leave anybody literally at the curb. Um, so when we started this system, we did a two week overlap, we had our fixed route still running while the new system was starting up and getting everybody used to it, we made the old fixed route free so a lot of people stayed there while they didn't have to pay. Um, but when it came to, um, I wanted to make sure that nobody was left behind when it came to uh, the unbanked. Um, those who didn't have access to smart technology. So we really wanted to make sure that we had um, a customer's call center. So under Ashley's guidance, they uh, we have a customer <coughs> a call center there. And uh, during the hours of uh, operation, Monday to Saturday, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., we, uh, we have somebody that can answer the phone. So if you uh, don't have smart technology, if you don't have a computer, you can call and book your ride. Um, you can book ahead as well. So we don't just do day of or ASAP rides. We do, you can book um, for your whole week of transit if you need to go to work and back. So somebody can call in and book, you know, their weeks of service. Um, it, it, that helps them, right? Uh, it helps our system actually uh, continually be optimized as well. Um, we, we made sure that the vehicles were all equipped to take cash debit cards, credit cards, and our smart cards um, that have pre, you can preload um, uh, a monthly pass, a 10 ride pass or single ride. And that's just a nice card that's tappable on the vehicle. You can load it yourself online. Uh, you can load it with the drivers if, if necessary. So those who just have cash can do that with the driver. 
Um, we are in the process of getting our town hall and our library set up to sell those cards as well. So people will have access around town to uh, purchase those cards. Um, those are the, the easiest, fastest, most convenient way to pay for transit. Um, so we're, you know, hoping to push people that way, but uh, we wanted to make sure that we didn't, we didn't um, over go too far on the technology that we eliminated some users. So we, we made sure that people could get on by a phone call. Um, we actually do have a few stops around town, um, actually mostly the Walmart, but um, where people can just board. So if you see a vehicle sitting there and they have room and you come out with your, you know, a couple of shopping bags, you can hop on and the, and the driver can board you right then and there and take you to your, your destination. So we, we really, really wanted to make sure that nobody was left at the curb. Um, if you do have accessibility issues, again, you still have to get to a bus stop in most places. Um, but a lot of, uh, we've been able to set up points of interest as well. So people can get dropped off close to a store or at a store door um, in our main business district. Um, there's ways that we can um, accommodate those who need a little bit uh, more accessibility. And some of our riders, like Raleigh said, go back and forth. So some of them use our fast service, which is our specialized transit that always picks you up at your door and drops you off at your door destination. Um, and But some have been able to use it in other times that they they need it. And, you know, if you're going out with family, maybe you want to get on, you know, and you all want to get on the same vehicle. It's it's very convenient for that that sense as well. So we, we really, really wanted to make sure that um, nobody was left out and that we only made we only grabbed more people who, who thought that this service would be um, something that they could use. Let's see, uh, Luke, I see some questions here. I could just jump in and answer them. Or... Uh, sure, if you, if you see one, uh, yeah, you can knock yeah, it down, I, uh, Wally. Uh... The, the question is how have net operating costs changed since implementation comparing to on-demand to previous? So there, the contract cost, the service is contracted out. Uh, regional limousine was a successful bidder and I don't know how much less than the conventional transit costs were a few hundred thousand um, <clears throat> um, so the, in terms of reduction in fuel maintenance it's, it's a completely different service we're not talking about conventional transit buses we're talking about vans versus buses so costs are down um, <clears throat> ridership's up and in terms of uh, uh, cost increase, well, that, you know, the town has to make a decision in terms of, uh, you know, uh, um, how well they want to accommodate the demand that wasn't there before COVID. So, so that's something that we're, uh, that the town and, and is uh, challenged with addressing right now. Uh, and one for um, the increase in ridership, are you seeing capacity issues where the passengers cannot book the trip? And I thought maybe Ashley, can you answer that? Have you turned down anybody yet? Um, we haven't had to specifically turn people away from the service. The only um, thing that becomes complicated is uh, near the end of service when people are trying to book rides um, because we do operate until 9 p.m. Um, so we've had to implement kind of like a last call um, to the service just so that the drivers are able to actually get to the customer and bring them to their destination within the time parameters of the service. Um, so that's the only time that we really have to kind of work with the, the customer and, and let them know what time they may need to be picked up if we're not able to go out to Black Creek, for example, at 8.50 and, and be back on time. Um, so that's kind of uh, the only time that we haven't really had to turn people away, but just kind of work with them, um, change their times. Um, we do run into instances where um, there are too many passengers trying to board maybe at the same time. Um, but the dispatchers are very good at working with the customers when they call in and letting them know um, our, our time for to be able to board them is um, within 20 minutes from when they call if they're doing an ASAP booking. Um, but sometimes if there's too many rides in the system that uh, will show up a little bit later. So the dispatchers are in a habit of booking the ride in and then uh, looking up that customer's trip to be able to give them a more precise time of when they'll be able to expect the car there. Um, just because when we started, it was going into the winter months and it was colder and we didn't want to have people sitting and waiting at the bus stops for too long. So uh, we kind of gave them a, a better indication of what time they could expect their vehicle there. And again, also trying to push um, for people to use the 
um, app as, as much as possible if they could, um, just so that they could watch the ride in, in real time and they'd be able to see uh, exactly when their car was coming for them. I think something that might be of interest to others is, is the learning curve for the drivers. So you have a limousine service and a huge fleet the as in Niagara region. Um, so the drivers are used to point to point. <laughs> and then you, and so when they secured the contract, the, the existing drivers that were on the conventional transit service are now going to this uh, on-demand service. So the learning curve uh, was a little bit longer with them being kind <laughs> and uh but eventually they they they, they were all trained and, and they're comfortable with it so it took a little bit longer from those that uh are brainwashed like me about conventional transit service you know so yeah and uh, uh, ashley i know you were on the, the kind of the front lines of that can you explain uh give us a little bit of background on how that happens uh so uh just to expand on Wally's point about the driver training, because it is, it, this is actually an interesting case for transit agency uh, where we have a new contractor coming in, but some of the old drivers uh, from the existing service stayed on. So can you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so we were really happy that all of the previous transit drivers other than two, which I think both of them um, decided that they were ready for retirement at that point. Um, other than those two, we took on all of the existing transit drivers who are all still with us, um, and some have actually moved into a dispatch capacity or role with us, so um, kind of a unique move there. But what was really interesting for us was to see the two different groups, because we had our previous, the previous transit drivers, and then we also brought in new drivers. So the difference in the learning between the two of them, someone who was used to having the fixed road and, and driving around in a circle, essentially, um, and then having some drivers who came to us and kind of had an easier time um, getting used to it just because they didn't have that um, traditional expectation of what a transit driver's role would be. Um, so, and I kind of spoke about this a little bit. Um, some of the drivers, I when we were um, initially launching the service, I'd say, oh, you know, there's a customer at this stop um, which is Emmerich and Central, as an example. And they'd say, well, where is that? And I said, well, you've been driving the transit for years and years, but when you're used to driving in a circle, sometimes you don't need to know those street names if you're not from in town. Um, you're just used to driving the road. And if you see a person, then you stop to get them. So I think all of the drivers have a very um, in-depth view of Fort Erie now and, and probably um, know more about the town than they ever thought that they would. But um, one thing that we we noticed was training was very very essential um I, I wish if i was looking back i would have spent even more time on training um, more in-car training one-on-one -on -one. um pantonium was great in providing a training environment that simulated um, the experience very well so i would have liked to do more one-on-one -on -one training with them and i think um, going forward, if we have to hire new drivers into the service, I'll definitely spend more one on time, one on one time with them in the cars. Um, but it's kind of that old adage of um, teaching an old dog new tricks. So um, someone who's just been used to what they've been doing for so long, trying to get them into the routine. It did take a while, but now we are about five months into the service and they're all doing really well and they're actually providing feedback and, and telling us how we can kind of make things better or um, what they're seeing out on the roads. And it's, we've got great communication lines between us and the drivers. So that's helped a lot. You notice when she said old dog, new tricks, she was looking at my, my screen. <laughs> no, never will. <laughs> a couple of uh, other, uh, just uh, somebody said, just to uh, answer a couple of questions. The fare is, you know, $3 fare. So, I mean, you go anywhere in this 176, 170 kilometers, it's, it's three bucks. Uh, no, the service is not going to uh, break even at any point. Um, so, no transit service does. So, they're just, so, the, you know, the subsidy covers the, the net cost. So, that's what it is. It's a service that's not a profit making business. I don't see that happening. Yeah. So. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Wally. And uh, I, I have a question for you, Wally. Again, uh, I would like you to expand on those reservations about on-demand transit, uh, because I think 
<clears throat> in the transit industry, it has quite a, you know, a lot of people don't believe it can work, especially at, at a scale. They think it, you know, you put it off to the side on, on your little low demand area, or you use your, you use it for paratransit. Um, so can you expand on those reservations okay. you had for the kind of full system replacement? Okay. Um, okay. So when I was, what, uh, just some background back in the nineties, when I was in early nineties, when I was in Kitchener, we'd have new subdivisions and, uh, wasn't enough demand out there for, for a bus. So what we set up were agreements with taxi companies to go out there and pick passengers up during the peak hour, bring them in to a transfer point at a mall or whatever. And, uh, and that, and we put them on. So it was a fixed route, uh, fixed route transit service and they paid a fare, et cetera. And so that was the first use with small vehicles that I saw. And then as demand uh, grew and more homes were built, that bus stop was now a com then grew to accommodate buses. So it was a good interim one. And I also, you know, in, in, in uh, Bradford, West Willenberry, when they had their first transit service, it was a community bus. And they conflict because it was, there was a go station there. They used taxis to uh, have an on-demand taxi service to take them into the go station. So basically, almost following a fixed route to get to that go station. And their service, the, 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 the taxi or their small van service, was more efficient, carrying more passengers per hour than the bigger vehicle. So, you know, this is uh, now taking it from. Uh, 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 certain pockets uh, to the entire community. So, you know, that's 170 kilometers in size. So, so the concept is there, but I've never, I was a little hesitant, but I'm thinking, can you do this for a whole community? And then when we looked at the numbers uh, that were only three or four passengers per hour, then if that's, that's the case, then bands make sense. But again, We've got some problems that we're going to have. There are issues there because you're getting this work trip as well as uh, the expanded rural areas that you're covering. Uh, so good problem to have, I think. And you, know, you saved a ton of money too. So. And it, yes. it, yeah. Same question to you, Jennifer, because yeah. I'm sure that you have a, another perspective on this. Like, like, was there any reservations about the switch or, or do, um, you want, do you want to add to Molly's comments? Yeah, I mean, there was a the couple of things that I think I mentioned earlier was, um, was accommodating for COVID. So while it was a good thing in a lot of ways, it also squished people together. So for us, that was a little bit of a concern. Um, but other than that, I was really enthusiastic to do this. This was something that when I read about it, I was like, we have to do this, this is exciting. Um, so I, you know, I think the reservation um, would be, or for us is don't get caught up in, it's not a one size fits all, not every community, not every city can do this. Not every um, community will operate at the same, right? So we looked at the Innisfil uh, model. We looked at, you know, different models where, like I said, first mile, last mile, that kind of thing. We tried to figure out what was the best, equitable, easiest way to, you know, uh, offer transit in a, in a more efficient way to, to those uh, in town. And so th this is what we came up with. And, um, one of the things though I wanna say operationally that we didn't really um, factor in, which is uh, actually causing us a little bit of operational issues is the fact that sometimes riders book a ride and don't cancel. And uh, if they don't you know, wanna come and, and a conventional bus service, hey, if you're not at the stop, it just keeps going. But in our service, um, once the driver has that ride in their schedule, they go out to that bus stop. Sometimes people aren't there. And so now we've just operationally wasted, I don't know, five minutes, 20 minutes, depending on where that person is. And if they're across town, if they're in a rural area, that really causes uh, some operational issues where we could have maybe picked up somebody else. And now we just went to a ghost stop, basically. So we're challenged right now in that um, we're trying to figure out what, what do we do with that? How do we uh, how do we politely educate our riders um, to say, please don't do that to us. <laughs> um, but you know, it's going to happen. So we're just trying to figure out internally, how do we, how do we handle that? Um, what does that do to um, how we would have modeled this if we had have thought of that beforehand? Um, you know, what, uh, and, and 
different communities are going to be different. Some communities may not have this problem at all. Some communities might experience it in, in a large number. I think we had, if I'm not mistaken, Ashley, maybe a thousand rides. What, am I wrong on that? That are close to um, a thousand rides in, in February that were like ghost rides. I was going to say, it's pretty, it's, yeah, it's pretty close to that number. Yeah, so that's a lot. That's a lot of operational um, time that we spent trying to pick somebody up and then didn't get a, a revenue passenger on the on the seat. So um, I, honestly, I don't know. Uh, we don't have a, a, a grand solution at this point. Um, we're working on it. And um, rider education might be one of those things. So uh, we're working on some, you know, some points to, to put on our website and maybe get, you know, some communication out there into the community um, about, you know, just booking and completing your ride and, and whatnot. So uh, that's a challenge. And uh, that's something we just never came to mind, I guess, before this. Uh, it does happen on specialized service. Um, so I'm not sure why it wasn't top of mind, but it just wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and if you think about it, uh, an unproductive fixed route is basically the same thing. You're just driving to empty stops. <laughs> but uh, right. this this one, it's it, you know, when you're dispatching a vehicle right there, you can really tell <laughs> when somebody's a no show. Right. And yeah, it's it's tough because do you punish the riders? You know, are you, you then you're keeping you know you can kick people off the service if they abuse it too much, but that has its own uh, <laughs> problems. So. I was wanting to get into the results now. Um, how, what have people been seeing in terms of results? And I, I think we, we can take a look at it operationally, like, like the increase in ridership is obvious, but have you been seeing anything else on the more you know, qualitative side? Like we can talk about you know, ride time, wait time and, and all that, but on the qualitative side, have you seen impacts in terms of more, uh, you know, are people, having access to uh, more things? Are you seeing you know, increases in business? And, and also what are you hearing from the riders themselves? Because I think ob obviously that's the most important thing. So, so what are the riders saying about the new service? And uh, I don't know, maybe Ashley, you can start with the riders because I know you're like, right on the front lines there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, we do have dispatchers in the office who kind of take the brunt of those calls, um, but I do get uh, a number of them during the day. I think what's really encouraging for me is that even our existing transit drivers um, will relate to me the fact that they see so many new faces. So that to me is really encouraging and says that we're doing something um, which is more accessible for more people. Um, I think Wally kind of spoke to it earlier, but the fact that we have kind of peak times at uh, those work times now and um, we are adding certain businesses as points of interest because people are using those to get to work. Um, so in terms of the quality, I think um, I, you're never going to make anybody, everybody happy. I think that's, that's clear, but on the most part, we actually do receive a lot of positive feedback. Um, from our customers, which is really nice. And um, just people saying that they're new to town and they're excited to use the service, first time users. Uh, we've gotten a lot of first time users this month actually that I've spoken to um, just because they're hearing positive things around town about it. Um, so that's really great to hear. Um, and then, yeah, just that people are using it for work and school. Um, I think that shows us that um, they're finding it more convenient to get around. Well, just um, sorry, Lisa, if you don't mind. Anecdotally, too, I spoke to um, in my previous days. I worked for the YMCA, and um, I had a coworker there who was working with a family, um, and their uh, foster mother, and she had several children in her care. And um, one of the children needed to. One of the teenagers wanted to work, and uh, busy person, busy mom, you know that kind of thing, running around. And um, we spoke about the service and, and the convenience and, you know, what, what this uh, young man could access now that they have transit along their area. And um, they were so over the moon excited that, uh, that this young man could take transit, uh, could get to and from a part-time job, could get to places in town, not only even just for work, but for um, leisure activities they could go they could get from a rural area to a park they could go to soccer uh they could go to the library they can um, do all these things that maybe they couldn't do before because transit didn't get close enough to them in a safe spot so um for their family it was life-changing 
Um, we have um, we have a lot of that uh, kind of thing happening right now. Um, our community um, community living members, uh, for some of for some of them, transit large bus fixed route was hard to to do, hard to handle. Um, they some of them just couldn't uh, manage it. Uh, now that they can get on at a safe spot and get off at a safe spot, and they don't have to transfer, they don't have to. Uh, they're finding um, independence. So this has been a huge changer for, for a lot of our community members, for sure. Oh, great. And just to, just to touch on that one point, uh, when you brought up transfers, so in the, in the old system, the, the fixed route system, did you have a lot of transfers? So you had those three lines kind of covering the entire, uh, like linking up the three urban areas. So were, were there a lot of transfers going on for those types of trips uh, in the previous system? Well, and if you were coming from one end of town to the other, um, so from around the beaches area, you know, into the sort of Fort Erie proper, um, people had to sometimes switch routes. So at the hub, um, there was a couple of spots in town you could get off and on and on a bus that was going one way or the other. Uh, I don't think people use that one as much. But at the hub, certainly there was people getting on and off and, you know, going to the north route from this, you know, the west route or et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and, and then for some, it was, it was a long ride, you know, they got to the hub, they had to wait, then they had to, you know, wait for the, the bus to then loop around to the other end of the city. And if you were at the end of that loop where you needed to go, you were on there for quite a long time, you know, you, if you were getting on and off, let's say our blue route, um, your ride to your destination might be five minutes, but your ride home is 50. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're always spending that, you know, long time on the bus, no matter which way you were going. So um, for some, yeah, this, and, and for some, it was confusing. They just didn't understand how to, to navigate that. So they, they just avoided the transit altogether. They thought this is too much for me. I can't do it. Um, so, so now that they don't have to do that, and they can safely get on one vehicle and take that all the way to their destination. Um, a lot of people feel more comfortable that way. Okay, great. And and just to, just to finish up with the results question, and I think this was touched a little bit by on the Q and A. But uh, Wally, can you walk us through some of the economics? I know you mentioned that this is a new operator coming in. Um, so so what do you see on the the economic benefits of this type of service versus? a fixed route service in the traditional sense? First of all, we never rehearsed that question before. So we had to <laughs> no. um, yeah, yeah. just because uh, yeah, yeah. I'm reading some, I have some questions here uh, and I, I think Jennifer's probably the best one to answer the economic one. Um, the, you know, first uh, some questions here is, this is a contracted service. It's regional limousine. Ashley is an employee of regional limousine. She liaises with the town of Fort Erie through, through Jennifer. And um, <clears throat> so that's that's how it works. Because they were saying, you know, they were wondering if, uh, if Ashley, you were a, a, a town employee, which you're not. So that answers that question. The other question they asked is uh, about the regional connect connection. And I don't know if Ashley or, or Jennifer want to address that. Because it's relatively new, isn't it? Are they asking how do we connect to the region? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, the regional, we have two connections actually, uh, one through Niagara Falls and one through Port Coburn. Um, the Niagara Falls is a conventional bus that drives into Fort Erie, comes to our hub. Um, and uh, there's two times in the morning, very early morning, and then it starts again at noon and it comes here on the hour roughly uh, till nine o'clock at night. Um, so it just comes in, does its thing. And so what we do is people can um, book their ride, they can book their connectivity. So they can book a ride to the hub to get on that bus for the time that they need to. When they're on their way back, they can pre-schedule that knowing that the bus will get here at a specific time. They can book for a car to be there. Sometimes we have cars, if we have enough uh, cars in service, we can have one sitting there in case somebody didn't know they had to make that call um, and they can be there. We're actually looking into some technology right now where we're going to put uh, perhaps one of those camera doorbells where people can access that in our shelter and call for a ride um, if they don't have a phone to, to do that. Um, so that's that's the one connection. The other connection comes from Port Coburn and um, they have an on-demand service in Port Coburn through the region. 
that will come into Fort Erie. So we have a stop that's in Ridgeway that our vehicle and their vehicle could meet. Um, you just, the customer has to do the work to book those connections. So they have to do the work to book their Fort Erie ride and their Port Coburn ride on two different systems. Um, that's a whole other discussion on a regional transit level. We are amalgamating next year, but that, that's a whole different uh, ball of wax uh, that we won't really get into in this conversation. But um, at this point, that's how we're working. That uh, system is, is going to, so they do have connections to uh, leave the community and, or for people to come into the community for work or pleasure, um, which is fantastic. So hope that answers that question. Oh yeah, uh, great. Question. What's the issue with strollers? Somebody asked a question about strollers. We still go out. You have strollers, car seats. Strollers, oh, um, so strollers and car seats are allowed. Um, the strollers, we, we ask that people keep them to the smaller versions if we can. Um, if somebody needs to uh, install a car seat, they're more than welcome to. Uh, the vans do have car seat um, mechanisms to install them. We ask that people book the accessible vehicles because that vehicle has a little more time booked into it. Um, as the feature for accessibility, we, we have more time to board a person who needs a, an accessible need. So we, if people um, ask us, we ask them to book that vehicle with a car seat so that it gives us just a little more time for the installation. But it runs, uh, because it's public transit, uh, it's not necessary to have a car seat. Um, we will not use the highway though, the QEW, if somebody has a child without a car seat. Uh, we'll just take a different route, that's all. Um, you can get anywhere in town without using the highway. Um, but uh, but we, we do allow car seats, we do allow for a stroller. Um, uh, hopefully it's small enough to fit in our trunk. Um, that's, that's our biggest concern. And, just to go a little bit further, if you have groceries, we basically say whatever you could have carried on a conventional bus, you can bring into our van. So, um, you know, if you have four grocery bags or whatever it is, we just sort of average that out for people. But uh, we don't we don't expect somebody to be loading our trunk full of, you know, with a large grocery cart full of groceries. Not something we're prepared to do just uh, for timing's sake and whatnot. But if you can carry it, you can bring it. It looks like uh, Kevin has an interesting question about virtual stops. Um, looks like it was just answered by uh, by Wally, but maybe we can uh, answer it to the audience. Uh, and maybe I can handle this one. But uh, essentially, if, tell me if I'm I'm wrong here. But we have put in virtual stops in locations where we saw lots of traffic. So essentially, if there's a popular store, you put in a stop that might not have had a bus stop previously. Uh, you just plunked it in in the system and then people can book trips. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. okay. So they are using virtual stops in some, in, in some sense. And yeah. now just looking at the time, uh, if you have any questions, put them in the Q and A and we'll try to get to them. But I have one last question and uh, it's what's the future looking like? I know there's the, uh, the amalgamation kind of looming over everybody there, but uh, what's the future, let's say in the next 12 months looking like in, for the service? Um, and I know before we were talking, we're talking about kind of a hybrid model with like introducing a fixed route. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Um, I don't know, whoever, whoever wants to talk about the future, uh, we have time <laughs> if anybody wants to add in their thoughts. Well, maybe just touch on it. We, we, we had a discussion with this in other meetings. Um, a lot of data, there's a lot of data, but there's still a lot more data needed to, to maybe eventually look to see if there's a business case to have, um, uh, say, a fixed route that, that covers off key points that frees up the vehicles to accommodate more of the, uh, the service outside the, the, the urban areas that this fixed route would operate. So you might have a bit of a hybrid service. We're not there, they're not, in my opinion, they're not there yet, but we recognize that uh, that that could happen down the road. I mean, what better way to design a transit system than knowing the point to point everybody's going? And that's what this technology is 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 allowing you to do. I mean, we used to do it with passenger counters, you know, origin destination surveys and so on. But here you've got some real life uh, um, data that you're going to use. The one thing we have <laughs> is a lighting data, so. You know, we knew where people were getting on, but we didn't know where they were getting off. Um, so now, now we know that, right? So we can, um, we are looking at that data to see where where are the high use areas in town. Um, 
I do believe like Wally said, that's quite quite a bit down the road for us. Um, I see that perhaps when when the transit is uh, operating under a different commission, um, they, they would look at that at that point. Um, so what's more for us in the next 12 months, um, I would say we're really just looking at our, uh, our numbers. How high are we going? How, how are we meeting the demand? Are we still meeting our customer expectations for levels of service? And um, if we're not, then we are having conversation about how do we add to the service uh, as far as vehicles and what do they look like? What kind of vehicles? Uh, are there more? Are they more seats or is it just more vehicles? Um, so the, those are the questions that we're trying to answer right now um, as we continue to grow. Um, I'm just so thrilled. I mean, already in March, we have seven more service days left and we've already exceeded February's numbers. So um, we're, we're well on track to continue this rise. And uh, so we're well aware of that and we're working very closely with regional limousine uh, and the team and to, to see how, how we can accommodate um, the, the service and, and, and you know, continue to run it at a great level for, for those who need it. Um, and, uh, you know, can, it's a, my director says it's a good problem to have and so uh, we're excited to move through this process and, uh, you know, ensure that we're, we're still meeting um, the levels of service that our council expects us to meet and uh, that our residents expect us to meet. And um, summer's coming. Um, we have a, a beautiful beach here that um, hopefully COVID stays, you know, where it's supposed to be now. And um, we were hoping to see some of our tourism come back and Canada Summer Games will be here. So it's, um, it's a great place uh, to live, work and play here in Fort Erie. And we, uh, we're excited to, Transit's excited to be a part of that and to continue to help people move around this town for sure. Oh, great, thank you. And uh, let's just see, we have a, just a couple more minutes left. Uh, I'll just take a quick look at the Q&A and see if there's anything we can quickly answer. Um, Here's one. Uh, did you look at right-sizing vehicles uh, prior to the implementation yes. of the service? What was the, okay, so you did, yeah, okay, it's yeah. a big, big shift. Unfortunately, I did the, the work in the previous study, so we knew what the demand was. So the, the vans that were selected were the right size, so I understand right-sizing transit. And it's just, we're running into problems because the travel patterns or the mode choice is been more transit now than it ever has been. So, and that's affecting the, the, <clears throat> the, the, the vehicle. So may require larger vehicles to right size, uh, match the demand. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think we, uh, we have one. Uh, yeah, what was the annual ridership before the demand? I believe it's tough to, it's tough to measure the, yeah, <laughs> that's a tough one. <laughs> We were, we were just over 40,000 in 2019, um, so pre-COVID, uh, that's how we ended our year. Um, and 2020, early 2020 was start, actually starting to exceed that. So we were, we were actually on, on par the first three months to probably have a 10 to 15% increase in the entire year of 2020 if COVID hadn't um, hit us hard. And so uh, we're back to those 2019 numbers right now, um, exceeding some of our 2020, early 2020. And um, so we feel very fortunate to um, sort of have recovered from uh, COVID in that sense for us. Um, and uh, so we're really looking forward to, you know, what, what can we bring this to and, and how can we manage those numbers? Um, do a little happy dance, you know, as, as, we, we, as those numbers come in. And, but sometimes Ashley gets a little bit, uh, <laughs> she's not as happy maybe sometimes because now she has to figure out how to move all these people. So... <laughs> <laughs> oh great uh, so uh, with that uh, I mean we're a transit uh, community so we want to end on time just like starting on time so I, I would just like to thank uh, from the bottom of my heart all the uh, participants today the panelists everybody who showed up today thank you and again you'll get a recording of this uh, so you can share it with your friends uh, afterwards and yeah uh, Thank you all for your time. Um, it's been great. And keep an eye out because we'll be doing a lot more of these webinars uh, coming up uh, this year. So yeah, thanks everybody and have a good rest of your day. Stay safe. All right, bye. Thank you. Bye.